and upskill that employee. If it works, we're going to put some more money to work at that. Now let's get to the numbers. Here's our latest vaccination count as of this morning. You can see that. Here are today's newly reported positive PCR and presumed positive antigen tests. The rate of transmission is continuing its decline, and that is definitely an encouraging sign. While we're on cases, let's do a quick update on the number of outbreaks in our schools, which have been determined to have been the result of in-school transmission. Over the week from last Tuesday through this Monday, that's September 27 to October 4, 23 incidences of in-school transmission were reported to the Communicable Disease Service under Ed's leadership, the Department of Health. So far since the beginning of the school year, there is a reported total of 69 outbreaks due to in-school activities across 62 districts impacting, as you can see, 319 students and 60 educators or staff. These numbers have all been updated on our dashboard at covid19.nj.gov. Additionally, the Department of Health under Judy's leadership is today, I believe, issuing a directive requiring all schools to report data to them on a weekly basis. This reporting will give us a more complete picture of the cases and vaccination rates among students and staff, which we can then report all out to you. And Judy will be able to provide a little bit more color on this directive uh, when she gets up to bat in a couple of minutes. And one last point on schools, as a matter of clarification, I want to make it clear that my executive order requiring all school staff to be either fully vaccinated by October 18th or face regular testing includes all bus drivers as well, regardless of whether their district employees are independently contracted. We're doing all we can to ensure that the school day is as safe as possible for all of our kids, and that commitment begins at the bus stop. Now moving back to the numbers, here are last night's reports from our hospitals and health care systems. Judy, I know you'll comment on this, but generally softly but trending in the right direction, uh, not with a big quantum step in the right direction, but generally going in the right direction. And then with the heaviest of hearts, here are today's newly confirmed deaths um, of, and losses of our extraordinary New Jersey family. <clears throat> so let's pause as we do regularly to pay our respects to three more who we have lost. We'll start with a remembrance of Kathleen Najito. Kathleen was 71 and a resident of Hasbrook Heights. Kathleen worked as the office manager alongside her husband, Giorgio, at their family-run printing business, Presto Print and Copy, in Lodi until their retirement. But as much as she loved the business, she enjoyed being the manager of their family even more, and they survive her. Her Giorgio, who, by the way, had lost his mom two and a half months before he lost his Kathleen. She's also survived by uh, she's also survived, pardon me, by her son, Joseph, with whom I had the great honor of speaking on Monday, and daughter-in-law, daughter Kimberly, and her daughter, Christina, uh, and grandchildren, Vincent and Mia Bella. She also leaves behind her brother, August, and his family and many nieces and nephews, cousins, and dear friends. I've said it many times in a different context that our small businesses are the backbone of our state, and it takes people like Kathleen to make them a success. May God bless her and watch over her memory and her family that she leaves behind. Next up, we recall Leon Leo Koenig. He lived in the Elberon section of Long Branch in Monmouth County. A veteran of the United States Navy and a semi-retired plumber, uh, Leo was an easily recognized, a recognizable member of the community as a youth sports coach and as an expert gardener who lent a hand to the creation and management of numerous community Gardens. He loved being outdoors and, in addition to gardening, listed beekeeping among his many hobbies. Leo was 83 years old when he passed, leaving his daughter Susan, with whom I had the great honor of speaking on Monday, and his sons Thomas, Kenneth, Christopher, and Benjamin, along with their families, including 11 grandchildren and four great grandchildren. He's also survived by his brother Bob and many friends. I'm not sure it was his business, or I believe it was his home but he was in close proximity to Monmouth University, and he developed a reputation over across a generation um, of women at Monmouth University for being the guy that they would go to and ask favors to help them out on the plumbing front. Uh, and his daughter wanted me to make sure I, I, I gave that uh, uh, 
shout out, um, and he was somewhat of a legend in, in the Monmouth, the broader Monmouth University family. He was predeceased by his wife of 37 years, Diane, and by his daughter, Donna, and they both passed in 2018. We thank Leo for his service to our nation and for a lifetime of service to his community, and may God bless his memory and his family. And finally today, let's honor the life of North Brunswick's Don Cachese. She was just 57 years old. Born in Bayonne, she had the great fortune to grow up along the Jersey Shore in Point Pleasant. And even though she moved inland, the beach remained her favorite place. A kind and giving person who lived her faith, Don was at her happiest when doing things for others, especially for her four sons or her beloved grandchildren. From a Sunday dinner to a Halloween party to a Christmas Eve extravaganza, knowing Don meant you'd be taken care of. Don left behind her husband of eight years, Ernest, her son, Stephen, Daniel, Dustin, and Matthew, her grandchildren, Tatum, Rose, and Denver, and her stepchildren, Teresa, John, Taylor, Tiffany, and Toralyn. Now, this is one. Um, the, 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 the joke is among the Irish, Mr. Callahan, you'll appreciate this, that the Irish sports pages are the obituaries. So I was, um, I was brought up... Uh, reading both the actual sports pages and the obituary section. I've done that my whole life. But Dawn jumped out at me. I read this obituary myself in the Asbury Park Press. And it jumped out at me because for two reasons. One is in the first sentence or, or two, Judy, it said that she died of COVID. And secondly, look at the picture of this woman. Healthy, in the prime of her life, um, just extraordinary, and it turns out 57 years old. So anybody out there who thinks this can't hit you, look again, look at this woman, uh, and, and, and listen to what I said about her extraordinary life and how she was the life of the party, literally, and she's gone. God bless her, and may God bless her and look after her memory and look after her family. And we honor and remember every New Jerseyan who has been lost to COVID, and we stand with their families in mourning and remembrance. So a few minutes ago, I mentioned that small businesses are the backbone of our state. So let's meet another of the small business leaders who has partnered with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority to keep our communities healthy. The Bucktown Mixed Martial Arts Studio in Belleville. I could take them, Pat. In Belleville is a nonprofit that teaches students of all ages a variety of martial arts disciplines along with meditation to create strong and resilient bodies, minds, and spirits. It's run by that guy on the left, Jay Isip. Bucktown had entered into a new lease agreement at its location just two days before the pandemic required him to close his doors. And working through the EDA, Jay was able to receive the emergency funding he needed to keep the dreams that he had for Bucktown MMA alive and to re-envision all that his studio could be for his students. And today his doors are wide open and his students continue to return to a safe and welcoming studio. I caught up with Jay on Monday, and I thanked him for never giving up, and I hope Bucktown is a part of Belleville's community for a long time. Check them out, 527 Washington Avenue in Belleville, 527 Washington Avenue. Go by and say hi to Jay and sign up, or check them out online, bucktown.org, bucktown.org. Next, I want to acknowledge with a heavy heart the passing of a pioneer and leader within our state's Latino community, Guillermo Guillo Beta Maldonado. Born, raised, and educated in San Juan, Puerto Rico, Guillo came stateside to study first at Rutgers University and then going on for his postgraduate studies at Cornell University. Since the 1980s, he was a fixture in our state's Latino community, founding or leading numerous organizations, including the Puerto Rico Action Board, the Latino Action Network, the Hispanic Directors of New Jersey, and the NJ Community Corrections Working Summit Impacting Communities of Color. He was also a huge advocate for bilingual and bicultural early childhood centers. He passed away from health complications in his native Puerto Rico, surrounded by his family at the age of just 64. So as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, we'll take a moment to honor and remember Guillo and all that he did across his career in for New Jersey. He has left a tremendous legacy. It's our job collectively to see it move forward. And before I turn things over to Judy, I want to quickly congratulate these two professors at Princeton. What a week for Princeton. Suki Manabi on the left and David McMillan on the right, who have each been awarded Nobel Prizes in Physics and Chemistry, respectively, this week. 
Princeton University. Wow. Dr. Manabi is the senior meteorologist at Princeton's, we should probably get him involved in our briefings, Princeton's program in atmospheric and oceanic sciences. His research into how atmospheric carbon dioxide impacts temp uh, global temperatures has informed and changed how climate models are made. I have reached out to Dr. Manabe, I've not yet connected with him. Dr. McMillan's Nobel is for his pioneering work in organo organo catalysts, uh, which I know, Pat, you studied, a new way of building organic molecules that drive chemical reactions, which in turn is making pharmaceutical research, to name one example, greener. Now, a cool thing, I spoke to Professor McMillan this morning. Uh, Dr. Manabe uh, was born in Japan and emigrated to the U.S. In, in Jersey. Dr. McMillan was born in Scotland and emigrated to the U.S and is now in Jersey. Princeton University, in particular New Jersey in general, have long been re recognized for excellence in research and innovation, and these awards further cement this already incredibly well-earned distinction. Congratulations to both of them and to Princeton University. On that note, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. At the start of the school year, the department announced uh, that $267 million in federal grants were available to assist local educational agencies and non-public schools with implemented COVID-19 screening testing for students and staff in K-12 schools. 758 public school districts and non-public schools have signed up for the screening testing program. This covers 552 public local education agencies, and 206 non-public schools representing a little over 1.4 million students and staff. As schools implement testing, this data will provide insight on the circulation of the virus among school children and school staff. This data, however, is not a reflection of the cases that are linked to in-school transmission, which is captured through the outbreak reports. In order to gather this information, as the governor said, the department will be issuing an executive directive requiring that all school districts report testing data to the Communicable Disease Reporting Surveillance System on a weekly basis starting October 26th. The cases reported to the department include any testing conducted by the schools, their testing vendors, and cases reported to the schools by parents, students, and staff. The aggregate reporting does not replace the requirement that testing administrators report individual COVID-19 test results to their local public health authorities. Schools will also be reporting aggregate vaccination data on staff and students to the department. The department will collect the information, analyze it for trends, and when we have complete data, we will share it in an aggregate form on our dashboard. Layered strategies of testing, vaccination for those who are eligible, masking, physical distancing, hand washing, and staying home when you're sick are the best tools for keeping our schools and communities safe for in-person activities. In August, the governor issued an executive order requiring all personnel in preschool through K through 12 to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 by October 18th. Until they are fully vaccinated, they will be subject to COVID-19 testing at a minimum of one to two times per week. As you know, children under 12 cannot be vaccinated yet. So we need strong vaccine coverage in these populations that come into contact with these young individuals in order to protect them. Everyone 12 years of age and older are eligible to get a free COVID-19 vaccination these vaccines are safe and effective. Yesterday, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services released a report that demonstrates the life-saving power of vaccinations. It found that COVID-19 vaccinations may have helped to prevent hundreds of thousands of new COVID-19 infections and tens of thousands of deaths, particularly among seniors. The report found that vaccinations were linked to a reduction of approximately 265,000 COVID-19 infections, 107,000 
hospitalizations, and 39,000 deaths among Medicare beneficiaries between January and May of 2021. Every 10% increase in vaccination rate in a, in a country resulted in an 11 to 12% decrease in weekly hospitalizations and deaths among Medicare beneficiaries. That's a testament to the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccination. This report underscores the importance of getting our senior population and those who care for them vaccinated. Vaccination rates have been increasing among long-term care staff. Appro uh, approximately 80% are now fully vaccinated and nearly 92% of our residents in long-term care facilities are vaccinated. Moving on to my daily report, as the governor shared, our hospitals reported 1,034 hospitalizations of COVID-19 positive patients or PUIs. Over the last two weeks, new hospitalizations have decreased by 16%. Individuals in ICU have decreased by 8%. Individuals on ventilators have decreased by 6% and the overall census in our hospitals of COVID-19 individuals are, have decreased by 7%. Fortunately, there are no new reports of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. There are 133 cumulative cases in the state. None of these children are currently hospitalized. At the state veterans' homes, there are no new cases among residents and no new cases among our patients in our psych hospitals. The daily percent positivity as of October 9th in New Jersey is 5.19%. The northern part reports 4.57%. The central part of the state, 5.82%. And the southern part of the state, 5.63%. So that concludes my daily report. Please continue to stay safe and get vaccinated. Thank you. Judy, thank you, as always. Um, pretty sobering statistics on who might have been able to stay healthy and st be still alive. Um, we've said this a lot lately, no playbook a year and a half ago, all of us trying to figure out how to make the best decisions based on the data that we had. Now we've got a playbook. We know exactly what works and, and the fact that people are willfully not using it or ignoring it has obviously huge consequences. So thank you for that. Pat, we got a fair amount um, going on on the, on the gun front. The Attorney General uh, has established a, a, a crime gun commission. Uh, I'm going to be signing an MOU with regional governors tomorrow and sharing data. Um, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Give us what you got there. Thank, Thank you, you, Governor. Good afternoon. Yes, with regard to that uh, gun violence task force, uh, the AG uh, is, we're officially announcing that. I think tomorrow we're having a state wide law enforcement executive call with the U.S. Attorney, Rachel Honig, myself, the Attorney General, first assistant. Um, and we really do think this task force is going to make a difference with the, uh, from an info sharing, intel sharing, what we're doing with ballistics across the state and, as we say, collecting, uh, collecting those dots so we can connect those dots. Uh, it's a phenomenal uh, effort that I, I'm looking forward to kicking off with the Attorney General. Uh, and I'd also just like to announce, although COVID had slowed us down, tonight we kick off our third Citizens Academy. It's a phenomenal community engagement effort where we have New Jerseyans from all walks uh, of life throughout the state uh, come and spend nine weeks in a row, one night a week, where we pull back the curtain and basically show them all facets of the New Jersey State Police, basically creating ambassadors for the state police from how we recruit, what training is like, uh, officer involved shootings, what that response is like, how we do infer internal affairs investigations. Uh, the last two classes, the feedback's been phenomenal and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to welcoming those new participants tonight to the log cabin as we kick off uh, our third Citizens Academy. Thanks, Gov. That is great. How, how big a group do you have? It's 20, 21. We try and keep yep. it small, just not only just because of COVID, but we find the interaction is great. But anywhere from uh, from pastors to guidance counselors to business owners, uh, uh, again, a very diverse group, and uh, I'm really looking forward to having them. And there. diverse geographically as well. I geographically, one, from, one, from one Sussex to, to Southern to Cape May. So very uh, diverse in all aspects. Um, Caramel's here, and he he may 
and want to amplify this as well. Um, you, get, you got gun violence, which is a national reality, which is up. We're, we're not immune to that, uh, including with tra tragic consequences. Having said that, I wouldn't trade our hand with any other American state right now. I mean, That's just right. the stuff that we've got in place. The big challenge continues to be crime guns that are coming into New Jersey from out of state. If we were an island, if we were a nation unto ourselves, um, you know, we'd, we'd be, I think, quite satisfied uh, relative to any norm. But that, that reality continues to bite us and that iron pipeline up the uh, Interstate 95 from places like Georgia and South Carolina we, uh, we, continues to be a scourge. We had a phenomenal uh, investigation unfold last night uh, speaking about South Carolina where our crime suppression detectives uh, seized nine crime guns uh, all from the state of South Carolina, ammo, high capacity magazines, and that's almost uh, a daily mission for these. Uh, Was it preemptive versus... Uh, did you get it before they, they yeah, yeah no we got it we got it as part of a, a long-term investigation and it's just uh, it's that kind of day-to-day -day interaction that we're if we can save if we can save one family from having to go through that tragedy then then all of our efforts will be worth it again it's so frustrating that it's overwhelmingly coming in from out, out of state here um, before we go to Brent uh, who we welcome back by the way Brent um, Two things. One is uh, the First Ladies here, I want to re remind everybody, New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund is uh, very much alive and well, uh, and any support you could throw their way would be great. NJPRF.org, NJPRF.org, still doing great work, so thank you for all of that. Um, and secondly, we won't be with you on Monday because of a holiday, but we'll be back a week from today at right here at 1 o'clock, unless Aliana tells me otherwise. And um, separately, if we need to get you for any reason between now and then, we will do that. So with that, Brent, welcome back. We missed you, and Thank fire you. away. Missed all. We, 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 I say we missed you. This will depend on what you ask, of course. <laughs> um, so given how successful private companies have been with requiring vaccines for workers or facing termination, would you consider taking the same step with state workers and teachers, meaning removing the testing option? When will applications for return to earn be rolled out? It's currently just a sign up to show interest. Do you have any update on the outbreak in Lakewood schools? And are there any other significant outbreaks in schools you're, you're investigating? Um, Rob Angelo almost always watches us. So if he's watching, I'll, I'll defer to him on when the actual application is up and uh, ready to go and return and earn. But I think that is quite imminent. Um, I think we leave, Judy and Ed, I, I think on the first question, we leave all options on the table. I, I think we like, uh, and part of the reason why Judy's doing the directive she's doing, to make sure we've got the, the totality of the data that we need to uh, make the decisions that we make. But I think we're, we are, I, I'll say two things. I think we're, we're generally satisfied with the uptake uh, and the prospective reality of the state workforce coming back in. Uptake as in educators in, who are already obviously on the job and state workers who are coming in. Um, but we leave all options on the table. I think we just have to do that, and that's the, the mode we'll be in. Uh, I'll come back to you on return and earn. Um, I don't have an update on Lakewood or other major, but Judy, why don't you jump in on that? No, I don't have an update. Nothing, no. No. We'll, come back. Oops. we'll come back to you on Lakewood if we can. And I think the updates are the ones that we showed. Uh, and again, those are ones, Judy, to make sure everyone understands this. Those are in-school outbreaks as adjudicated and decided by the local health authorities and reported up to you, right? So where they have definitive, as definitive as you can get evidence that it was an in-school transmission as opposed to something in the community that was brought into the school. Um, and again, I'll come back to you on the return and earn piece of this. Let's go across to Dave, who's been displaced again by... The First Lady. Dave, good afternoon. I will not hold it against anybody, but thank, thank you, you, Governor. Um, you guys mentioned that the, uh, I think, Commissioner, you mentioned that the hospitalizations are dropping. We're seeing the RT slowly going down. Cases seem to be slowly going down. Um, what is in store once we go inside in about a month and the holiday season kicks off? How bad do we think this might get in terms of um, the COVID metrics? Have any models been put together on this? Um, is it possible Delta might be starting to fade? Uh, do we have any sense of that? Um, 
with regard to the school numbers, a total of 319 student cases and 60 staff cases is pretty low. I mean, that's very good, I would think. You're very happy with that. But as we also know, many kids are asymptomatic. Do we have an, a sense about what's really going on here and what the real totals are? Uh, testing, I believe, is still limited uh, in terms of, you know, all of the students in a particular school. So why are these numbers staying so low, do we think? And finally, regarding your comments, Commissioner, on the screening and testing program that's being kicked off, can you explain how this works? I mean, who is getting tested and when? I, I'm assuming it's not every student and every teacher and staff members in the schools. Uh, how will this work? Is the testing part of the screening process or is it separate? Please explain. Thank you. Dave, I'll kick off and Judy turn it to you and perhaps add on this one as well. I, I, th I think I'll give you this as a, as, as a layman as relates to medical. Uh, I think it's, it's unavoidable that once we conduct more of our lives inside that this thing's going to kick up in some form. I, I, I don't know how we avoid that. But running against that, and I think these are positive currents that run against that, our continually high vaccination rate, boosters, which, by the way, we, we, we need to, again, work with the federal government to make sure the messaging on that is, is crystal clear, which I, I, I think, in fairness, from the feds has not been, and also make, these, make this a, as, less, as, as low a bureaucratic process to get boosted as possible uh, and make it as widely available as we feel responsibly. Um, but I, I think it's inevitable. But again, that's going inside on the one hand versus very high compliance. On the other hand, how that nets out, I'll, I'll defer to the experts. So how would you answer the going inside, Judy, and any comments on, on um, either of the, of the other two questions? Um, what, what appears to be, and I would agree with your assessment, well within the range, well within the range of any uh, acceptable uh, outcome at the moment in schools in terms of you know, we, we, we pray for everybody who's sick, more than, more than zero is too much, but that's a reasonable, I agree with your assessment, it's a reasonable place at this point in any color on the screening or testing, Judy. I'm um, sure. Uh, first on the uh, predictive modeling, every two weeks we uh, look at our assumptions around predictive modeling, and we do expect, uh, particularly after Thanksgiving, if we compare uh, ourselves today to what happened last year, we do expect an uptick. I can say with the decreasing hospitalizations and steadying of the cases, um, the predictive modeling that we've just done is far different than it was even three weeks ago. Uh, and that's why we update it every two weeks. And the assumptions are based on the efficacy of the uh, vaccines, um, the recommendations that are coming out of the CDC on who can get vaccinated and when and the impact of those vaccinations, the current hospitalizations as a source of truth uh, on the data and how that impacts both upward to the cases and also downward to uh, ICU and uh, ventilators. So right now we expect an uptick. Uh, we expect it to occur after Thanksgiving, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, but we do expect it to be based on what we know right now within a range that uh, can be handled, uh, the capacity can be handled very well by our hospitals. Judy, anything on the screening testing question? The screening, the, the executive uh, directive will identify the cadence of um, screening testing in the schools based on the, the, the disease uh, prevalence uh, in their region using right now the Cali scores. We're also comparing that to the CDC scores. Uh, and that will identify the uh, cadence of the testing, whether it's once a week or twice a week, and um, that'll be, that will all be laid out for the schools. Um, I don't think, I don't know, Ed, do you have a, any more specificity? We've been working on this for a while. <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to add to the question of Ed, uh, how, how about any observations, if it's okay with Judy, on the question, the other question that Dave raises, which is, hey, the school numbers seem good, but we also know that there's a lot of asymptomatic realities out there. How do you, how do you sort of square those? And those are good questions, and, and I'll start by saying yes. I, I agree that the school numbers are looking good here. One of the things that we do pay attention to is trends over time and age 
uh, of those people testing positive. I mean, not just looking at what's happening in schools, but looking at all zero to five year olds, zero to eleven year olds, uh, five to eleven year olds, uh, etc. And we're really too early to give any definitive trends now because the school year has just begun and we're just beginning to see some of those numbers start. Uh, but overall, it's relatively reassuring, meaning that the overall trends are decreasing. And while some of the younger population isn't decreasing as much as the older population, that would be expected as they're going back to school and beginning to be exposed more and so forth. So overall, the, the trends are certainly reassuring. It was certainly concerning to me as children and college age people in particular went back to school and that's one of the things we saw last year is as college age kids went back to school we began to see increases in that age group and one of the nice things that we've been seeing again so far it's very early particularly in new jersey we're not seeing an increase really in the rates in the college age kids uh, probably largely because they're much more vaccinated than uh, than the younger kids of course so Again, overall, and I'm kind of going around here, the numbers are looking good. It's nice to see everything declining. It's really too early for, for me to say definitively that we're seeing trends here, but the overall patterns are, are, are positive as far as what we're seeing. It's, it's also um, more than insignificant that the data we showed for schools is through October 4th, so that's basically a month of uh, school. So that's... Um, Brett, I'm going, I'm, as, as I expected, Rob is listening and he said the following. There isn't an application per se. They sign up and express interest, and then our business services unit connects, them, connects with them rather to set up a formal contract on the training and wage replacement. And if you want any more color, um, we can easily get that for you. I don't know. Back to Judy and Ed for a second before we go to Joey in the back. Um, I've, I've thought of this, I've said this publicly, but I haven't gotten your, your permission to say, I think this feels like a sign curve that is sort of dropping as it, it, through the various waves. So the first wave was the worst, it went down, it kicked back up, the second wave was not nearly as bad, it kicked down, Delta brought it back up, but not as bad as the second wave. My gut, with uh, seeking permission and uh, blessings here from each of you, my gut tells me, if I had to predict, it's gonna kick up but it's gonna continue that pattern where it kicks up, but it doesn't impair or come close to impairing our ability to the healthcare systems to, to take the capacity. Does that sound fair? Judy's giving me a thumbs up, so I'm good with that. Thank you. Joey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I see you uh, brought your colleague with you. Yeah, since he's here, I'll, I'll only ask one thing. Um, so do you have, Governor, a progress report on the nomination of Rachel Wiener Apter to the New Jersey Supreme Court? Um, and do, I, do if, I have what support? A, a progress report, any kind of you know, update on that. Um, and if that nomination doesn't work out, you know, if uh, Senator Shapizi doesn't give senatorial courtesy, have you vetted any re uh, potential replacement candidates? Do you have any kind of plan B? Thanks. Um, I, I just, we haven't talked about Rachel in a while, so I'm glad you asked it, which gives me the opportunity, Paramo, with your blessing, to talk about what an outstanding uh, person and professional uh, Rachel Weiner Apter is. Uh, we've had very good discussions with our colleagues uh, in the Senate, uh, especially with the Senate President, with uh, Judiciary Chair Nick Scutari, um, and I continue to be extremely, not, not, on, not only am I a, a huge fan and bull on her, uh, but specifically uh, on the prospect that she will, uh, her process will come to a successful resolution. Anything to add to that? You're good. Fantastic. David, welcome. Good job again last night. Thank you, Governor. How are you? I'm well. Uh, I, I just have one question regarding, or one set of questions regarding the executive order on election workers. How did you arrive at the $300 level instead of the 400 that was in the Senate bill? Uh, election officials are telling me they are not yet ready for early voting, that, that they're not fully staffed. Will you uh, train the National Guard on electronic? If, if you haven't decided to do that yet, at what point would you say we need to address it? It could be a problem. Uh, the statewide voter registration system crashes whenever it's overloaded. The Department of State is saying that they expect every county to be able to upload their information each day of early voting. Uh, how confident are you that the SVRS will work? And then, and then finally, at what point? Will it be in one week, two weeks, where if election officials say they don't have staff for early voting, would you consider raising that salary again? 
Um, all good questions. I don't have a magic answer on the $300 other than I think the collectively um, the team feels like that's the, 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 the amount that that's clears the market, uh, that, that brings supply, demand, and balance. Um, we also, parallel on that same executive order, uh, did something else which we have talked less about, but I think it's worth raising in the context of your questions. Heretofore, it has been a requirement that a poll worker work at a polling place in the county of her or his residence. And that has been lifted, at least for this election. So it's those two steps together um, that have given us the confidence that this is the, the right package. Would we reconsider whether it's National Guard raising the rate, um, other steps? Um, the answer has to be yes, because having a successful election and having democracy as strong as it can be is, is, a, core, uh, uh, is a core reality and pillar of our state and our nation. Um, so the answer is you have to leave the door open for anything to make sure that we're properly staffed. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a bipartisan um, reality. This is good for everybody. I, I don't frankly care who you vote for, but we do care that you vote. And we just know, think about the common sense of, uh, and again, I'm glad you asked this because it allows me to riff on this for a second. If you only have one day to vote versus what we now will have, uh, which is 10 days to vote, you, you take a lot. We were having this conversation uh, earlier, uh, Tammy and I, in a group. You take away a lot of risk. Um, snowstorm. Your train is, breaks down. Uh, you work Monday through Friday, two jobs. Um, th th just an enormous amount of flexibility here that we're injecting into the system, which should help everybody, Democrats, Republicans, unaffiliated voters. <clears throat> I'm not a technologist, but the Secretary of State, I believe, is confident that our te technology infrastructure is robust enough <clears throat> excuse me, to handle the daily uploads from each of the 21 counties. Uh, I don't want to speak for her, but I believe she has that confidence, and I, I have that confidence, therefore, as well. Um, and, if, and maybe Paramel and you can connect afterwards if there's any more color in any of that. Good to see you, and again, good job last night. Sir, you'll close us out today. Good afternoon, Governor. A uh, question from David Cruz. Your opponent in November's election and others are calling on you to use some of the federal aid money from American Rescue Plan to replenish the unemployment insurance fund and other state needs. You said you've been waiting for guidance from the Biden administration, but the state's economy is hurting now. How long is it reasonable to ask small businesses and individuals to wait when many are hanging on by the slimmest of margins right now? Question from Leah Mishkin. New York State and City together have pledged $27 million to assist undocumented immigrants who were impacted by Tropical Storm Ida. Will you make a similar pledge to provide financial assistance? And does the state know how many undocumented residents of New Jersey are in need of help after Ida? Thank you. Is that it? Yeah, on the first one, I, I've, I've, it's part of the debate which David and uh, two others moderated last evening for the lieutenant governor, uh, and I uh, salute uh, Sheila as I always do. Uh, her opponent <laughs> said something which was ludicrous, that I uh, increased the tax on small businesses beginning last Friday uh, of $250 million three days after having made a pledge that I wasn't going to raise taxes. Uh, that was a bipartisan bill that I signed, by the way, with all due respect. Don't let's, let's not let facts get in the way. And it was to smooth out a process that otherwise would have been very abrupt for small businesses. We've put at this point about $775 million into small businesses since the beginning of uh, this pandemic. Only California and New York have put more money into the small business community than New Jersey. Uh, and as you may remember, we're the 11th largest state population-wise, so we're punching way above our weight. And we still have American Rescue Plan money that we want to responsibly um, and carefully invest in the state over the next now what will be uh, 27 months, uh, and we'll do that uh, in a responsible way, unlike some of the way we've spent uh, monies that have come, up, come our way in the past. And certainly small businesses will be a big part of that. The return and earn program is directly, um, that's $10,000 per employee, up to four employees, 
in the first six months of their employment as long as you train them. That's a lot of money. Uh, and as you, as you heard earlier, 2,100 uh, have, 2,100 businesses rather have expressed interest. Um, I don't have an exact number, Pat, to you on, on, on documented as, as it relates to uh, Ida, but that is something that we've been looking at very carefully with our partners at FEMA. We did, by the way, we, we, since we were last together, we did a, a very, another successful, I think, virtual town hall on Monday. Was it Monday afternoon? Yes, um, and it is true you need a Social Security number uh, in order to get through that process. And we're trying to work to get as creative as we can to make sure anybody who was impacted by this gets the help that they, they, they rightfully deserve. But I don't have the exact number offhand. Do you? I don't think we do, but I could certainly <clears throat> ask OEM if we can track that down. We could come back to you, if uh, Aliana, if you can help us keep track of that. It's a good question. Um, that's it. That's all she wrote, Judy. Um, so we, we, we're getting out early today, um, unusually. Uh, great to Judy, Ed, great to have you both. As always, Pat, First Lady, Paramount, Eliana, Sophia had the mic today. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I guess my words of wisdom as we close are, are consistent with some of the back and forth we had, Dave, especially with you, and that is, you know, it's October, what is it, 6th? Um, it's, we're lucky if we get a 70 degree day. We're m moving much more of our lives inside. We're coming out of, I think, pretty successfully some religious holidays in September, disproportionately in the Jewish community, and I think we, we came through that in, in good form. But we're in the thick of that big, now cold weather holiday season, uh, among other things, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, uh, back to back to back to back. There's, there's certainly one, ma we do have a magic wand, virtually a magic wand, and that's getting vaccinated. And if you're eligible for a booster, and again, uh, very simply, and this is very simple. If you got a Pfizer booster, it's six months since you had your second shot, um, and you are either 65 and older, or you work in a in a retail-oriented um, occupation: healthcare, police, fire, re grocery store, transit. You 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 can you you make that judgment for yourself. Get your booster. Get your booster. Moderna has submitted their data. It looks like that's, you, you mentioned to me earlier, that could be a, a week from it. Uh, uh, October 14 and 15, they start that process. That's next week. That's a good sign. J&J &J has now submitted their data. Um, get vaccinated. And if you're fully vaccinated and you're eligible, get your booster. And in the meantime, if you're indoors, I was indoors in a couple of places yesterday, more on the campaign front than official business. And if you're, it's common sense. If you're inside and you're with a bunch of people and you're packed in and you have not literally gone person to person to check whether they're vaccinated, put a face mask on. It's pretty clear when you're outside, and, and we've had enough Jets and Giants games at this point to know when you're outside, even if you're packed in, it's, it's just not remotely as lethal as it is when it, you're inside. So get vaccinated. If you're vaccinated and you're eligible, get boosted. And then if you're inside and you just don't know the status of the folks around you, put one of these on. Is that fair? Thanks, everybody. God bless.